This video is brought to you by Blinkist. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com forward slash biographics will get one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership. And let's get into it. Being the second born child in a royal family can be a blessing in disguise. Nobody expects you to rule, so in a way, you're kind of off the hook. But sometimes history gets in the way, and unexpected events can bring you into the limelight and put you on that throne. That crown may represent one of the youngest, smallest, and most peaceful nations in Europe, but that does not mean that trouble will not get in your way. This is what happened to today's protagonist, one of the longest serving and most respected royals of the 20th century, King Håkon VII of Norway, the voice of dignity against traitors and invaders. At the time of King Håkon's birth, Norway was part of a union with Sweden. It had an independent cabinet of ministers and its own parliaments, but the formal head of state was the King of Norway and Sweden, Karl IV, from the House of Bernadotte, based in Stockholm. Therefore, Norway did not have a ruling dynasty of its own. The man who would become King of Norway was actually a Danish prince. Born near Copenhagen on the 3rd of August 1872 in Charlottenland Palace, he was the second son of the Crown Prince Frederick and Crown Princess Louise of Denmark. At birth, he was christened as Christian Frederick Karl George Valdemar Axel, known simply as Karl by those with shortness of breath. His elder brother would also become king in the future, King Christian X of Denmark. While growing up, Karl would knock time and time again on Christian's door, asking him, do you want to build a snowman? Do you want to ride our bikes around the halls? Not really. These guys were actually incredibly serious, and they received extensive private tuition at the palace. At the age of just 14, Prince Karl began his training as a naval officer, so not really any snowmen in sight. He worked hard alongside the other cadets and was not accorded any special privilege. Karl graduated seven years later in 1893 with the rank of sub-lieutenant of the Royal Danish Navy and was later promoted to first lieutenant. With that, Karl ticked one of the boxes expected from a prince, a military career. The second box was finding a suitable match, in other words, meeting and marrying a girl, preferably from another European ruling house. At that time, you could not throw a stone into a royal palace without hitting someone's cousin due to the tight network of familiar relationships among rulers. Karl did not stray from the norm, and in 1896 he married his cousin from the United Kingdom. She was Princess Maud, the daughter of King Edward VII and his Danish wife, Queen Alexandra. Alexandra was the sister of Frederick, Karl's father. If this is getting confusing, here you can feast your eyes with the family tree of the royal houses of Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and the United Kingdom, so you can have fun tracing the blood ties amongst them. I will post a link to that family tree in the description below so you can take a closer look. But let's not forget about Maud. She was born in London on the 26th of November 1869. Since her early years, Princess Maud attended regularly her mother's family gatherings in Denmark. It was one of such occasions that she came to know her cousin Carl. Their wedding was celebrated in Buckingham Palace on the 22nd of July 1896, and the princely couple settled in Copenhagen. But Carl and Maud always kept strong ties with the UK, and in fact, their son and only child, Prince Alexander, was born at Appleton House in Norfolk, England. This happened on the 2nd of July 1903. Little did the young family know that their lives were going to change drastically in the next couple of years. On the 7th of June 1905, the Norwegian Parliament, known as the Storting, passed a resolution to dissolve the Union with Sweden. The dissolution between Norway and Sweden was a momentous event, which was born from an apparently lesser dispute, a conflict over the question of a separate Norwegian consular service. Norway and Sweden had their own cabinets and parliaments, but shared a single head of state, King Oscar II. But Norwegians always felt like the lesser party in the Union. In fact, they did not have their 
their own foreign service missions and were subordinate to Sweden in all matters of foreign policy. A new sense of national identity was brewing in Norway, and the Storting adopted a decision to establish an independent Norwegian consular service. For those not familiar with the subtleties of diplomacies, embassies maintain relationships with the government and institutions of the host country, while consulates support citizens abroad. In practical terms, Norwegian expats and tourists had to rely on Swedish consulates. King Oscar II refused to sanction the Storting's decision. As a result, the Norwegian government resigned. The king did not succeed in appointing a new government. This crisis meant that the union between the two Scandinavian countries was no longer effective. And well, that takes us to the 7th of June 1905, when the Storting Assembly unilaterally voted for a dissolution of the union. The Storting extended an offer to King Oscar II to appoint a prince from his own House of Bernadotte as the new King of Norway. This gesture of goodwill would have relieved the tension now mounting between the two nations. King Oscar, though, formally declined this offer. The Storting needed another candidate. An early version of LinkedIn would have tried to solve the issue via mass mailing to thousands of unqualified applicants, but the Norwegian Assembly was more effective and turned to another candidate much closer to home our friend Prince Karl of Denmark. He clearly fitted the job description. Job ID number one, Norwegian king and head of state. The ideal candidate should fulfill the following prerequisites. Be male, military officer, preferably in the Navy as they have the smartest uniforms. Scandinavian, familiar with Norwegian language and culture. Related to the House of Bernadotte, for example, via his mother Louise, niece of King Oscar II. Have close ties to the most powerful nation on earth, Britain, for example, via marriage with a British princess. Must have sired a son to ensure succession, have a clean driver's license and good Excel and PowerPoint skills are not essential but welcome, and of course we made the last two up. This offer was extended to Karl in autumn of that year. The Danish prince was not a power grabber and had great consideration for the will of the people. He was well aware that the majority party in the Storting, the Liberals, were considering the idea of making Norway a republic, so he insisted that before accepting the crown he should listen to the opinion of the Norwegian people. On his proposal, it was decided that a referendum would be held to decide Norway's future form of government. The referendum was held on the 12th and 13th of November 1905. The result was almost 260,000 votes in favor of a monarchy versus almost 70,000 for the republic. This gave Prince Karl a clear popular mandate. On the 18th of November, Karl found in his inbox a telegram sent from the president of the Storting, formally offering him the Norwegian throne. Prince Karl happily accepted the offer, announcing that he would change his name to Håkon, while his son Alexander would be known as Olav due to his love of the summer season. The king's choice of name was significant. In Old Norse, it translates as High Son or Chosen Son, and it had been used by Norwegian kings centuries earlier when the country was independent. Orkon also adopted a personal motto, Alt for Norge or All for Norway. Now, just before we get into the application of that very motto, let me tell you a bit about today's sponsor who make this video possible, Blinkist. Look, it's not always possible to sit down and read or even listen to all of the books that you would want. I'm a pretty busy dude, so I understand that, and I don't read nearly as much as I used to, or as much as I would like to. But the good news is that I have an app on my phone called Blinkist, which you can download, and then basically it provides 15-minute summaries of all the best non-fiction books. So, and, and by the way, you can either read these summaries in about 15 minutes, or you can listen to them as well. Something I've discovered I, I, I almost exclusively listen just on my way to and from work and when I'm pottering around the house and things like that. Something I've recently discovered, funnily enough, is their discovery section. And they've got these things called cur curated lists where you can open up and they've got, okay, so here's one, Flow the Ultimate State of Mind, and in it they've got nine titles that they recommend. The top one, unsurprisingly, is this book called Deep Work by Cal Newport, which I have read, I think I read it last year, maybe the year before. When did it come out? Like 2016? And this one, you can, like, let me just see if I can play a little segment for you. In between the two tasks, Leroy would give a quick test. So yeah, you've got like this 15 minute summary of the book. I've read this book, so I find it fantastic because I've mostly forgotten what it's about, that I can go in and get this summary and it reminds me of the rest of the book. But it's not really necessary to do that if you just want the best stuff from one. You grab it in there. That is Blinkist. 
There are tons of books, so whatever you're into, you're gonna find something you like. Now, the first hundred people to go to Blinkist.com forward slash biographics will get a week to try it out, and you'll also get 25% off the full membership. Again, that's a seven day free trial. You can cancel at any time at Blinkist.com forward slash biographics. Link below. Right, let's get back to our story. On the 25th of November 1905, Norway's new royal family sailed into the capital Christiania, later Oslo, on the naval vessel Heimdall, named after the guardian god of Norse mythology. Prime Minister Michelsen welcomed the king with these words. It has been nearly 600 years since the Norwegian people have had a king of their own. Not in all this time has he been solely our own. We have always had to share him with others. Chosen by a free people as a free man to lead this country, he is to be our very own. Once again, the king of the Norwegian people will emerge as a powerful, unifying symbol of the new independent Norway and all that it shall undertake. I really love it if this speech was followed by knights chanting, the king of the north, the king of the north. But that didn't happen. Remember, these are serious guys. The speech was followed by a salvo of cannons, which is still cool, and church bells ringing throughout Oslo. On the 27th, King Håkon swore an oath of allegiance to the constitution. On the 22nd of June 1906, King Håkon and Queen Maud were crowned in Nidaros Cathedral in Trondheim. Once again, Håkon showed himself to be a king of the people. Well aware that the custom of coronation was considered to be archaic and undemocratic by many citizens, he opted for a subdued ceremony. For instance, the traditional lavish procession previously staged by the Bernadotes was eliminated. The king and queen were escorted to the cathedral in a single coach drawn by four horses. The travel itself to Trondheim was conducted with little ceremony by train and carriages with many stops along the way so that Håkon and Maud could get acquainted with the people of their new country. Once they arrived at the cathedral, they were welcomed by 2,300 attendees and by the two bishops who were to perform the ceremony, Bishop Wexelson of Nidaros and the wonderfully named Bishop Bang of Oslo. And yes, that was his real surname. You can look it up if you want to. Bishop Bang greeted the king with the words, May the Lord bless your going in and your going out now and forevermore. Very appropriate for Bishop Bang. I'm just going to stop there though before I get sent to hell. Immediately after the coronation, King Håkon immersed himself in Norwegian politics and culture. Polar explorer Fridtjof Nansen introduced the royals to the national sport, skiing. King Håkon also started new traditions such as the much-loved annual children's parade. But besides these rare popular celebrations, Ian Maud showed great moderation, especially in comparison with the other royal families of the time. The royal court was small and expenses they were kept to a minimum. This was yet another sign of Hawkins political sensibilities. While aware that more than 20% of the nation had Republican sympathies, he felt it important to maintain a modest lifestyle. This moderation was also in line with Norwegian tradition and respected the fact that Norway was not a wealthy country at that time. Today, the country is the eighth largest producer of oil worldwide and the third largest producer of gas, but the first drillings, they were still decades away. King Håkon was also wary of respecting the Norwegian constitution, to which he had sworn an oath of allegiance. He firmly believed that political power should be in the hands of democratically elected representatives, but he still wished to be kept closely informed about political affairs by the government. Although he might state his views on a certain case, he always deferred to the majority in the council of state, unfailingly supporting policy decisions, and he was also careful never to show an affinity for any political party. During his first years on the throne, Håkon oversaw important reforms such as the institution of universal female suffrage in 1913. But a more testing ordeal was just around the corner. That was, of course, World War I. In the years preceding World War I, Hawkins Foreign Minister Jörn Lovland outlines Norwegian foreign policy along two directives. Neutrality in combination with an active trade policy. Neutrality eschewed political alliances that might drag the country into foreign wars with the implicit agreement that Norway was within the British sphere of influence. The government expected the British Empire to defend the young country in any case of foreign aggression. When Germany declared war on Russia on August 1st, Norway, along with Sweden and Denmark, issued a declaration of neutrality. 
The next priority for the country was to provide supplies, feed the population, and maintain economic stability. This led to a difficult balancing act for the Norwegian government. On the one hand, trade with Germany was vital for the country's economy. On the other hand, the UK pressured Norway to become part of the economic blockade of Germany. In the spring and summer of 1915, Germany started to buy huge quantities of one particular supply from Norway. That's fish. It was tons of fish, any fish-related item they could get a hold of, in fact. The result? Well, there was hardly any fish left for the Norwegians. Cod was out of stock, salmon was out of stock, haddock was out of stock, fish stock was out of stock. What little fish was available was incredibly expensive. In an attempt to quell exports to Germany, Britain decided that they would buy Norwegian fish instead. This decision decreased even more the availability and affordability of a vital food supply while flooding Britain with stocks of Norwegian stockfish. In autumn of 1916, life was dire for Norwegians. To continue with the fishing theme, they were caught between a rock and a hard place. On one side, the German Navy had extended their unrestricted submarine warfare to the Arctic Sea, sinking several Norwegian merchant ships trading with Russia. On the other hand, Great Britain had imposed a bargo on coal imports as leverage to prevent Norway from selling copper ore to Germany. Haakon and Maud they were not oblivious to the plight of their people. In addition to conducting an even more frugal lifestyle, the royal couple established a fund to assist citizens in extremely difficult circumstances. Luckily for the country, the Norwegian and British governments reached a deal, the Tonnage Agreement, in February of 1917. This was a very clever setup. First, Britain would lift the coal embargo. In exchange, Norway would suspend trade with Germany and supply the Entente instead. The Norwegian merchant ships would travel in convoys protected by the Royal Navy, reducing the risk of sinking by the Kaiser's submarines. The clever bit was that the the agreement was signed by the Norwegian Ship Owners Association, which camouflaged the Norwegian government's involvement, allowing them to preserve a formal neutrality. Hence, Norway became known as the neutral ally. The positive effects of this agreement, though, did not reach all levels of society immediately. In June 1917, ordinary citizens were still struggling to cope with a cost of living that had increased by 250% since the start of the war. Over 300,000 people took to the streets in June to demonstrate against a lack of food and the money to pay for necessities. That's roughly one-seventh of the overall population. The government did not fall, although this crisis led to a radicalization of the Labour Party, whose members even considered revolution as an answer. Luckily for Hawkon, the revolution did not take place. Rather, an evolution of the electoral system happened in 1919, which ensured a fairer representation of the working class. Years later, in 1927, this reform led to the Labour Party winning the majority at the Storting. In 1928, Hawkon resisted pressures to form a government led by the Conservative Agrarian Party and respected Labour's majority by appointing its leader, Christopher Hornsrud, as Prime Minister. The Conservatives were not happy about the decision, but it would take only three years for the Agrarian Party to return to power. Among their ranks, a former military attaché, now Defence Minister, became very active in using the armed forces to quell Union strikes and keep the spectre of Bolshevism at bay. His name was Vitkun Quisling. And it's at this point that I'd ask you to check out our video about him. He was a Nazi collaborator, became the definition of a traitor, and was the man who welcomed an invasion so he could be prime minister. But here's a quick summary. Former Defense Minister Quisling founded the National Union Party in May of 1933, modeling it after the Nazi and fascist parties. Defeated in two consecutive elections, Quisling forged a friendship with Hitler's advisor Alfred Rosenberg and exploited these ties to facilitate the German occupation of Norway. But during the 1930s, these schemes had not yet become a source of worry for King Haakon, who had to face more personal issues. On the 20th of November 1938, his beloved Queen Maud died in London after a prolonged Long illness while visiting her British relatives. Maud was buried in the Royal Mausoleum at Akershus Castle. Apparently shy in public, Maud was known for being warm and vivacious with family and friends. Her original personality set her apart from other queens of the time. She enjoyed outdoor activities like riding and skiing more than court protocol and was a keen dancer and a competent photographer. She was also directly involved in Prince Olav's upbringing. Haakon would surely have loved to have been by her side during his and her country's darkest hour, the German invasion of April 1940. In our Quisling video, we cover in detail the invasion of Norway, the country's resistance efforts, and its eventual liberation. Today, I'll talk about the same events, but from Hawkins' perspective. 
An occupation of Norway was part of the Third Reich strategy, as the country could provide the German war effort with iron ore and an extensive merchant navy. It would have happened regardless of Quisling's scheming to facilitate the German invasion when he was hoping to be installed as prime minister. German troops invaded Norway on the 9th of April 1940. The heavy cruiser Blücher sailed into the Oslo Ford in the early morning hours of that day, transporting a landing force. Their task was to arrest the king and the members of the government to compel Norway to capitulate immediately. But the Norwegians, they were no pushovers. The ford was protected by the cannons of the Oskarsborg fortress, as well as torpedo batteries. They all opened fire on the Blucher, and she sank at 6.22 a.m. with 1,300 sailors on board. The sinking of this ship delayed the German troops' advance on Oslo, giving the royal family, the government, and the storting representatives the time needed to escape to safety in Elverum in eastern Norway. There, the storting gave the king and the government full authority to rule the the country for the duration of the war. On the same day, Crown Prince Olav ensured the safety of his family by having his wife Martha and their three children cross the border to Sweden. They then traveled to the United States in August. Thanks to Martha's friendship with Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, she became a sort of unofficial Norwegian ambassador in Washington. On the 10th of April, King Haakon met with the German envoy Kurt Brauer. The Germans demanded that the government step down. The king had to appoint a new government headed by Vidkun Quisling. The king put forward the German demands in an extraordinary meeting of the Council of State in the village of Nyburgsund. Hawken stated that he would not attempt to influence the decision of the government in this matter, but that he could not comply with the German ultimatum. He would rather abdicate than have Quisling as prime minister. Without directly imposing his will, the king had managed to influence the decision of his ministers into rejecting Quisling. Upon hearing of the king's refusal, German forces repeatedly bombed the village, but he and Olav managed to escape to safety. On the 15th of April, the first Allied landing party had arrived in Narvik. A combined Anglo-French-Polish force would support the Norwegian army in engaging the German troops. But the Allies were ill-prepared for mountain warfare, and the Luftwaffe had complete air superiority. By the end of May, the British cabinet had decided for a total retreat to avoid losing the expeditionary force to the Germans. King Haakon was left with a difficult choice, fleeing or staying. Staying by his people would have seemed natural, but the Germans were not hiding their intentions to have him captured. He could have then been forced to provide legitimacy to Quisling's government. In the end, he decided to flee the country. He would establish a government in exile in London, from where he could denounce Quisling or any other collaborationist cabinet and lead the resistance effort. On the 7th of June 1940, the king, the crown prince, and the government traveled to England. On the 9th, Norway had surrendered. The Norwegians and their allies they held out for two months against a German invasion longer than any other country except for the Soviet Union. Like I said, there were no pushovers. From London, King Haakon became the foremost symbol of the Norwegian people's will to fight for a free and independent Norway. His radio broadcasts from London they served as a source of inspiration for young and old alike. Back in Norway, the Germans had realized that Quisling was an unreliable leader with little popular support. The reins of the country were effectively taken by Reichskommissar Josef Turbevin. He attempted to establish a legal occupation government elected by the Storting to collaborate with the Nazis, but this required the king's abdication. In a speech on the 8th of July 1940, Haakon again made it clear that he would not give in to German demands and that he was still the legitimate head of the Norwegian state. On the 25th of September, Turbevin abandoned all plans to collaborate with the existing Norwegian authorities. He declared the king and government deposed and outlawed all political parties except for Quisling's National Union. All activities in support of the royal family were forbidden, but King Haakon and the government in exile stood firm in their resolve to fight until Norway was liberated. Over the next five years, Haakon's speeches would inspire daily, constant acts of civil disobedience against the German occupiers. Haakon's monogram, a seven imposed on a capital H, became a symbol of defiance. Haakon also inspired the creation of the Milorg, or Home Front. This resistance movement was a constant thorn in the Nazi side. It worked closely with the Special Operations Executive and was responsible for the destruction of the Telemark plant, which stalled the German research on the atomic bomb. By the end of the war, Norway was garrisoned by approximately 400,000 German troops, one soldier for every six citizens. This gives an indication of how difficult it was for the Reich to tame the Norwegians. Again, like I said, no pushovers. Germany capitulated on May 8, 1945. Turbevin committed suicide on the same day, while Quisling was trialed and executed in October. 
King Haakon returned home on the 7th of June, the fifth anniversary of his escape to London. In late summer 1945, he embarked on a tour of the country to see for himself the destruction caused by the war, as well as to encourage the ongoing efforts to rebuild infrastructure. The Norwegians were happy to have their king back and grateful for his resolve during the ordeal of the war. A collection was launched to raise funds for a special 75th birthday present, a royal yacht. King Haakon accepted this gift in 1947 and rechristened the vessel the Norgo, which he used in many official visits abroad. Hawken continued to maintain strong ties with the UK even after Maud's death. During one of his visits to London, he attended a theatrical performance of The Moon is Down by John Steinbeck. The original novel was published in 1942 as a means to encourage resistance in Nazi-occupied countries, and its setting, characteristics, and plot were based on the invasion of Norway. One of the protagonists is the elderly, calm, authoritative Mayor Auden, who encourages his citizens to disobedience and open rebellion against the invaders. It is not difficult to find Hawkins' influence on this character and on his opposition to the treasonous shopkeeper Coral, a Quisling in disguise. After 52 years on the throne, aged 85, King Haakon VII died at the royal palace in Oslo on the 21st of September 1957 and was buried at Maud's side in the royal mausoleum at Akershus Castle. So I really hope you enjoyed today's biographics. As a final thought, I will leave you with Haakon's dilemma. Would you have stayed in Norway by your people and risk giving legitimacy, even involuntarily, to Quisling and Turbovan? Or would you flee the country like he did? And a little quiz for you, can you name a European royal who decided to stay after the German invasion? Well, post your answers and your opinion in the comments section below. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Blinkist, link below, and I'll see you next time.